Welcome to this session. My name is Dr. Gikandi. You are lecturer for BIT 3201. The course title is uh, Object Oriented Analysis and Design. Uh, that's our course. And this time, we want to look at the introduction of the course as uh, we are uh, um, uh, allowed the beginning of the course. So um, we begin first by highlighting the course objectives so that we get familiar with um, uh, um, what the course focus is about. The first objective um, or what you should uh, have as a learner by the end of the course is to be able to understand the elements of object-oriented approach. The second objective is to be able to analyze the key themes um, in object-oriented analysis and design. And when you talk of themes, um, is uh, similar to characteristic or characteristics. The third objective, um, you should be able to explain the types of modeling notations. Modeling notations. Next, you should be able to illustrate application of unified modeling language. Um, our next objective is to be able to explain the key techniques uh, that and tools in object-oriented modeling. And the next objective is to illustrate application of key modeling techniques in realistic problem domain. The next uh, objective of the course is to explain and illustrate the key benefits of object-oriented analysis and design. And our last objective is to identify different types of object-oriented uh, systems, different types of object-oriented systems. So those are our course objectives. So having done that, we now go to the introduction of the course. And here we are going to look at the key concepts, the key dimensions of object-oriented analysis and design. Um, so, um, object-oriented analysis and design is a software engineering approach which models the system as interacting objects. It's a software um, engineering approach that models the objects um, in an interactive manner in the development of the system. Each object, in this case, represents a system entity. It represents a system entity which plays a vital role in uh, building of that system or in development of that system. Object-oriented analysis as part of uh, this course or as a key component of our course is uh, focuses on analysis of functional requirement. That's object-oriented analysis. It focuses on analysis of functional requirement for the system. We shall be coming uh, back to that to explain more. On the other hand, object-oriented design takes analysis model as input. What we have done at the previous stage, at the analysis stage, it takes analysis model as input and produces implementation specification. So these two phases, these two dimensions, analysis feeds into the design. So it uses uh, design uses um, analysis as input to be able to produce the uh, uh, output which uh, informs implementation or what becomes implementation specification. So if you look at the, this diagram, it tries to illustrate that process. The first part of the process we are saying is functional requirements. You are able to specify. We shall be going through uh, in a later session to uh, through a session to understand the process and the techniques you use to um, define those requirements that we are calling functional requirements. But at this point, I would like to uh, define functional requirements as um, what the system is supposed to do, what is the system supposed to uh, serve the user in terms of the purpose that it is able to um, be useful. So you will be understanding the user needs and then you uh, define the requirements. Of course, in a systematic way, 
in the analysis phase. Uh, at that point, uh, uh, those requirements becomes part of object-oriented analysis model. Uh, the output you get from um, uh, analysis modeling then informs the object-oriented design model, whereby your output is implementation specification. So that is the whole process, and in that process, it will bring about so many components that we shall be going through in later topics. Um, at uh, this uh, point, I want to have um, all you to have a clear understanding of the benefits. What is the relevance of object-oriented modeling? So that we know what we shall be doing, what is it meant for, why is it useful, why is it relevant? So that's what the benefits will help us to understand. So when you understand, we shall be focused to achieve those by the end of this process. One of the objectives uh, and uh, the benefits that you are able to realize through this approach of object-oriented uh, modeling, object-oriented modeling, is that there is the ability to tackle more challenging problem domain. So it's able to handle uh, more complex situations compared to other approaches. Other approaches here, I would like to talk about um, sequential versus non-sequential. So object-oriented modeling adopts non-sequential um, uh, system, whereby you focus more on the problem, not the how. In the uh, opposite of that, the sequential approaches or the structured approaches to systems development, you, the user or rather the designer does more on the how, and that makes it even a challenge when it's sequential to handle a complex problem. So object-oriented is able to handle more challenging problem uh, domains because of its non-sequential characteristics. Um, we shall be seeing the details of that as we unpack um, the components uh, in our later stages. So the other thing we are talking about is, uh, as a benefit, is improved communication. That's among users, analysts, uh, designers, and programmers. So object-oriented approach enables better communication compared to other uh, software engineering approaches. Um, it also enables reusability of analysis, design, and implementation output or results. So reusability means you can always save resources by not repeating everything and being able to selectively apply what has been done before by the analyst and the designer to do uh, or to develop uh, analysis level and design level of uh, the system so you can be able to reuse. So the component of reuse mean helps to save resources, to save time, and also uh, in relation to the next uh, uh, benefit is that there's increased consistency. So increased consistency will make it easier for uh, the system developer, will make it easier for the system user in terms of learn learning curve. So um, uh, object-oriented uh, modeling approaches help um, developers and uh, system analysts to realize or to bring foundation of these benefits. So there could be other benefits, but these are the key ones uh, in terms of what uh, we intend to uh, apply as a specialist in computing. Uh, now, in this process, in understanding these two dimensions, uh, we need to understand uh, analysis and design, they are part of a system development process. We say they are part of software engineering approach. So, and that means it is a process with various stages, a process with various phases. Being a process with various phases, it means uh, or it can be referred to as a life cycle. So when you refer to something as a life cycle, it means it has various phases that flow. The order of flow depends on the specific um, process. Now, in our process here, we are saying the process is going to be progressive. 
And we remember we said a progressive does not mean necessarily um, it's uh, sequential. So it's progressive whereby in analysis and design, we are building representation of a system. So in the first two stages, analysis and design, we said you come out with uh, implementation specification, which are more of um, a system Represent, uh, representation or system abstraction. What you get, what you are calling implementation specification, they inform the third stage. And the third stage is uh, uh, implementation or what we call coding. If I go to the next uh, slide, you are seeing those um, stages, those phases as they progress. And uh, um, in a nutshell, the life cycle begins with the requirements, or we can call it analysis, to bring it closer to our context today. Then requirement and analysis uh, then informs the design, that's what we have said. And then what we get from design as output, we go to implementation. Uh, the rest of the stages is verification and maintenance. But for purposes of this course, we are mainly going to focus on the first two stages, analysis and design, and also be keen on how that output from design is going to be useful at implementation stage. So what we do in the first two stages, we really determine the kind of implementation. The other stages are verification. Implementation I'm saying is about coding uh, the programming part so you cannot call before you draw your system abstraction. Verification is uh, entails testing the system, whether it's doing as it was intended, as specified, as uh, spelled in the analysis phase. Then maintenance is where you are able to implement and uh, follow uh, to ensure that your system is, uh, remains relevant and is working as it was intended. So now we are saying our key phases um, or stages of interest is analysis and design. Analysis, we are saying, is when you are able to model real world um, in order to be able to show um, real, uh, the important properties of your system. So analysis captures the important properties of the system. We call it functional requirements. It's going to capture the functional behavior of um, your system. Um, and of course, in a systematic way, we shall be seeing tools that could be relevant in analysis. Uh, then uh, in the design, it is where you go further to define the model you have created, the system abstraction. And abstraction in this case is a representation of the real. And uh, in analysis and uh, output, then you inform the design. So in the design phase, you continue to refine what you have in the analysis until you are able to adapt it to the environment. And at this point, you are then able with your design specification to inform the third important stage in implementation phase. But for our course, we shall not be doing the implementation, but we shall be ensuring that the output we shall have is helpful or will be effective and actualizable at implementation. So we have to see ahead, though we shall not be doing um, uh, that implementation in this course, but it will come in uh, another course. So the course provides foundation for um, programming languages that you'll be learning. Now we are saying, and uh, if I go back, we are saying that we want to inform implementation. I want to note that the implementation we are informing uh, here must be also following or adapting object-oriented approach. That means implementation being programming, we shall be um, doing analysis and design that fits object-oriented programming languages. And uh, an example of object-oriented programming language, the common ones, we have Java, we have Phoebe.net, they C++. So uh, those are some of the uh, programming languages that you'll be learning as part of what will require you 
to apply the knowledge in this course. So you cannot do Java programming if you don't understand how object analysis, uh, object-oriented analysis works, how object-oriented design works. So you'll be blank, you'll not be effective in implementation, in programming using object-oriented approach. So uh, object-oriented analysis and design informs object-oriented programming. That's at implementation phase. So um, Hafik said that our key focus is on analysis phase and uh, design phase. Let's expound what analysis entails. What does analysis entail? So we need to think of analysis as a stage where we define functional behavior of the system. I mentioned that earlier. When we say that, because you are an expert, you are the one to be doing this. So you don't stop at saying you are defining the functional behavior. How do you arrive at that functional behavior? So there are three sub-processes that you need to um, understand and be able to apply them. Um, uh, these uh, processes, or sub-processes, because they are part of object-oriented analysis, include, or they are, one, else, uh, you should be able to elicit, elicit, or identify requirements. And in eliciting requirements means that you understand or you define what the software need to do, what the system need to do. So you need to be able to define that and what the problem uh, the software is trying to solve. So my next question that you should pose in your mind as we answer it is that who is the source or who is the source of um, what the system need to do? Where do you get this information? Where is the source? So one source or basically the source should be um, user needs. So you need to do a needs assessment. So user needs uh, need to be uh, done so that uh, uh, to be understood by engaging with the users. So at this level, there is high involvement of the users uh, because you don't think what they need, they need to share what they need. And then it is at that point you, as, as an expert, as an analyst, you help them to refine it and to fit it into the systems or software world. Um, so what is the problem? And when you have the user needs, it means also that uh, uh, you are solving a certain problem. I want to point out at this point, when we say we have a problem, it doesn't mean that uh, something is not working. So that's very important to understand. A problem could mean in software development could mean there is a gap because the current process is suboptimal, is working but not to the best. So there is room for improvement. So when we say we want to understand what is the problem, it doesn't mean that if you approach a company and tell them that I want to improve your system by giving uh, consulting as an analyst, it doesn't mean that they have a problem or they would ask you, do you think we have a problem? Not necessarily, but in the uh, software development domain, whether the problem is a gap that is an issue at hard or whether it's about improvement, we refer to that as a part of the problem domain or the gap. So it is you as an analyst to be creative. Sometimes if you are a consultant, you are the one to, uh, or even if you are not a consultant, you want to remain relevant, you want to remain productive, so you must be able to see what others cannot see, what users cannot see. So you don't only see things that are shouting as problems, you are able to identify, or you should be able to identify gaps that relates to improvement. So that's, you will see the requirement. The next sub process in this is that you specify the requirement. After you elicit the requirement, you specify the requirement. That is describing the requirements, usually using um, what we call uh, notations, and this, uh, which means, notations mean some modeling techniques. This could be use cases. It could be um, 
uh, user stories or it could be other forms of notations like state diagrams we shall be looking at those techniques, those notations at a later stage. So you specify requirement by describing the requirements using a standard, a systematic technique like use cases. Use cases is a technical term referring to one of the uh, notations or simply techniques for uh, analysis and uh, systems analysis modeling. So after you have that, then uh, you are able to do the conceptual model. When we mention the word conceptual, we mean that um, you are able to give an abstract representation, a sketch. When you say something is conceptual, it's a sketch diagram of what the system does and uh, how it, uh, how, um, uh, it uh, may be able to do it uh, using uh, or combining different entities. So conceptual model is still a very abstract representation. So at this point, you have to identify uh, the important objects. At this point, it continues to get more technical and you are the expert. So you define those objects until you are able to see they can represent the required functional behavior of the system. So you draw them using a simple diagram. An analogy to that is how, um, is, is how, uh, is, is how um, an architectural designer in, of buildings in engineering does. Before the house is built, they have to do the abstract representation of the building before the contractor comes. So uh, this conception model or at this level of object uh, analysis and design, those are the things you are doing. So those two, uh, three stages must be keenly done, systematically done until you are able to have um, a conceptual diagram which now becomes the output of analysis stage. And the uh, output of analysis stage now informs our next phase, our next key dimension in this course, that is the design. So we now go to uh, introduce the concept of object-oriented design. Remember we are saying at this level, we are introducing the key concepts and how they work. Let alone, we continue to unpack each of them. So uh, there are so many topics behind this concept. So now, in an art shell, what is um, this phase doing, the design phase? So the, at the analysis, uh, you are able to identify the functional requirement. Now, being in the design, using the input um, or under the output of the analysis as input here, you are able to identify the objects more clearly. You are also able to bring those objects. And now, because you are clear on their behavior from analysis, the conceptual diagram, you are able to show their relationship at the conceptual level, um, then you bring them here and you start now creating a more detailed object or you make your objects more detailed in that beyond capturing their relationship, beyond capturing their behavior, you are able to uh, describe their specific attributes in a technical manner using the notations using the techniques. So at the design phase, then you are able to apply even more advanced notations or techniques so that um, now your design is clear so that your abstraction or system representation is clear to be able to uh, be output as uh, something complete to inform implementation stage, to inform the coding stage in our life cycle. So here you take a lot of your time to go back and forth until you are sure that all the attributes, all the interactions in that uh, system is captured. What happens if you leave some attributes? You should ask yourself what happens if you leave out some relationship and or some interactivity that is necessary for the system to function. What that would mean 
your system will not meet the requirements. Your system will not meet the user needs. So it's a very critical stage. And it also means where need be, or if not sure, you have to revisit uh, some of the functional requirements, what you did in the analysis stage. So it's not um, an exclusive uh, phase. So you would have to keep going back and forth and revisiting your output in the analysis. Was it sufficient? Another thing we have to do, we have to uh, consult or to keep engaging the users. And uh, um, in this approach, where we keep consulting the users, then we say we are uh, uh, oriented to uh, the user needs, or we get oriented to the user needs. So your checklist is based on the user needs. So when you engage the user to understand your conceptual representation, they are going to give you feedback. That big feedback, all the items they pick not working, if it's working, that's fine. Feedback is more critical here and of importance when it means something is not as I expected. So I give an example. If uh, you are developing a system to manage a library, and it is the librarian who know what they do. So system development is about understanding the user and the processes that have to function within what they do. So it's not about to have the most sophisticated system. It's about capturing all their needs. So this librarian, who is your client, who is your user, uh, or user of your system, is going to be, um, in, you are going to be engaging them so that they tell you that uh, uh, if they issue, they have one um, aspect they do is issuing books. You may capture that a uh, Bolua can request for a book and uh, go with it. Uh, and when they borrow and return, would they be eligible to borrow again? So the librarian know the rules, the institutional rules, how they manage circulation of books. So it could be in that organization, in that library, you cannot be allowed to borrow a book consecutively twice or thrice. Or you would be prevented from borrowing if they are already booking. So you need to understand their need. So you may capture one object as borrowing or issuance desk. That's what they call it. Whether it's, uh, or it's an online system, it will be also the insurance, insurance uh, where they issue books section. So they will be able to tell you what rule governs that section. So if you are made one of those, if you are made the number of times allowed to borrow, that means your um, uh, attributes are not enough. The system behavior is getting not to capture all the user needs. And it means the system has deficiency. So you have to really engage the user. So it becomes a psychic process. Um, now, it, this is where we said the input uh, for object-oriented design is therefore uh, utilizing the output for the analysis phase. So anything that you are given as feedback by the user uh, that uh, the system is not working, you have to revisit the user requirement. You have to revisit the functional requirement. So you don't design before you capture that is analysis. So all other, if I put it more straightforward, you don't introduce new things at the design stage. They have to be based on the analysis phase. So um, when you are very ambitious, you may be tempted to think, why are these people not doing this? But remember, or why are they not introducing this entity? Why are they not introducing this behavior? Like the number of times you can borrow or why uh, do they do that? So it sometimes, or to that extent, you need to engage the user to understand how the system functions. Remember, their system is governed by institutional regulations. Even if it's an individual system, he has his needs, and he has a purpose for that system. You can only advise and agree this is a part of your requirements. But then you cannot introduce new things at design phase. So otherwise, your system will not be meeting the 
uh, requirements uh, professionally. Uh, now, uh, I want to have a discussion uh, that is in form of an assignment, but before you go to the assignment and analyze it, I want you to um, be able to think about these two concepts. We have given a lot of all highlighted benefits that we shall be unpacking of object-oriented approach. Uh, these benefits, you should ask yourself, is there anything without a limitation in this world? Or what will object-oriented approach not do? And what um, uh, will it uh, do best? And are there alternative ways of doing it? So when I talk about uh, limitations, I mean it could be a gap in the way they function. Limitation could also mean that there are better ways of doing the same. So when you find or you refer to something as a limitation, it doesn't mean it is not working. It means we could have introduced new approaches, especially in IT, a uh, lot of uh, concepts are evolving. A lot of technologies continue to evolve every day, even as we talk about what are the benefits or what are the limitations. So um, when we talk about limitations again, it could be, for example, we relate the limitations to the benefits. For example, one of the benefits we mentioned about was about reusability. When we mention about reusability, is it, how much is it uh, extending, extending or is it limited to some point? So we are saying that in object oriented, for example, one limitation, the reusability is limited by design. The usability of a system, that's one of the limitations, is limited by design. So you as an analyst, you will have created a specification uh, with ability to reuse, of course, being object-oriented design. But based on your expertise, based on how the user requirements became clear, that will determine um, how much you can be able to reuse. So in that case, uh, we can say that reusability is limited by the system design in, uh, in overload. So it is not endless, it's not without limit. So that is one way to look at limitation. Within the benefits, what does not extend um, in an undefined way or without limits. When we talk of a limitation also, it could be that we have some um, uh, side effect that uh, doesn't, uh, meaning that some components, the way be object behavior works may also be a limitation to the user or to the programmer or to dueling system engineering. So uh, those uh, ideas would only come by wider leading. So part of uh, answering that question will be revisiting the benefits that we said. Uh, for example, uh, I have talked of the benefits of uh, usability. The other benefit is about, if we revisit that, the other benefit is about uh, more challenging um, uh, or being able to solve more challenging problem domain. So when you are able to solve more challenging problem domain, it's also that, is that limited also? It is uh, not necessarily. So we are saying that object-oriented can solve complex problems if you follow that approach. But note that this is limited to the capability of the analyst, the designer. So it is not limitless. It has um, other requirements or it is subject to other factors. How much does your, uh, your analyst knowledge, expertise, experience? So uh, that would be a limitation. Another limitation, as you will be leading further uh, on the same, uh, it's also important to be critical. When you say you can use something, what is reusability? Does it mean you reuse it statically without considering um, 
that there could be room for improvement. So reusability in itself does not mean um, copying and paste. It would still mean uh, one limitation. It still requires programmers effort and uh, sufficient resources should be allocated. So you shouldn't overlook. If you are re-engineering your library system and the initial design was object-oriented approach, you shouldn't imagine that uh, there will be a lot of reuse. Reuse could become a limitation, sorry, could become a limitation to um, uh, improvement of the system, to optimizing the system. Reuse is also limited to assumption that there are no new approaches, there are no new notations, there are no new techniques that have come in place. But remember, generally, across the group, knowledge is evolving. Um, some of the notations we shall be looking at, are the most common one, like use cases, we shall be looking at what is that state diagram, among others. Assume we have four key uh, notations or techniques now. If a fifth one evolves, it um, may influence how much and how we'll use, how much and how we'll use. So it is important to bear in mind uh, uh, that uh, the benefits are not unlimited. The other factor is about consistency as a benefit that is also be looked at or can have the other side um, as a limitation. So when you have a lot of consistency, what if your system did not carry the best quality? What if it was already too complex for the user? So when uh, there is a lot of consistency, if you don't consider other key qualities of a system or usability of a system, uh, then um, consistency uh, from the uh, expert point of view is not going to be very helpful to the user. If you don't incorporate other requirements to ensure that your system is truly usable or to either put, um, uh, be user-oriented. So as you lead further, you are going to be seeing other perspective or other lenses that you use to uh, uh, identify limitations. So limitations is um, it's an open debate. It's a critical debate whereby you identify a focus or an aspect, then you just fight. So uh, it, it, it is not static. What you consider limitation is, is an argument that you form. So uh, th that is one part. Uh, the other part, uh, as part of guidance to approaching this, I am also requiring that you engage in identifying implementation approaches. We are saying that our output must be suitable for implementation, and our implementation also takes ob object-oriented approach. Our implementation, that is output of the design phase. After analysis, design, our final output, which is uh, an implementation specification, is going to adopt an object-oriented approach. So I want you to identify uh, the implementation approaches. One part of it is the programming languages. What programming languages are associated with uh, object-oriented design? And because they are associated with object analysis and design, of course, we have many languages. These languages differ in terms of their specific characteristics and strengths and weaknesses. So why would you choose to do your implementation in one language and not the other? Why should you choose uh, filing different, uh, or rather different implementation environment? Why should you? Uh, or what affects how you choose your implementation and fulfillment. So that's part of the critical debate we shall be engaging uh, until we go to the next, or before we come to the next session, or as we continue to engage. So when you see what affects your implementation um, and fulfillment, that is the programming language uh, that af uh, you are able to adopt as a designer, then you will be now getting familiar on how you need to package your output and design. 
Again, when you talk of uh, object-oriented programming languages, they are also differentiated by level, and then we said knowledge is evolving, so um, you need to be careful about that and be keen. So we need to understand what happens in implementation. And at this point, as we conclude, I want to bring the aspect of in systems development, the life cycle we had, you could be the analyst, the uh, designer, and the implementer, the programmer. Other times, you could be only an analyst and a designer, or one of them, and somebody else will come to implement. So note that in different work environment, or individual choice, it would uh, affect whether what you analyze for, what you did system requirement, will be the person to implement. So we must be able to communicate. And that's why one of our benefits was about improved communication. So that means when you are the analyst, it doesn't mean you are necessarily the designer. You could be, and you must also, even when you are not, if you, even if you are only an analyst, you must understand what designers do and how they work. You must also un understand what happens in programming, even if you are not the one to program. So other times you could find you do those three things. But even when you are comfortable, that I'm the one to be implementing this. So I'm the one to pack my bag, and I'll know how to, as an analogy, where I located, where, in what part of this bag, or which pocket. So you shouldn't take it casually that you don't become careful. Why you need to be careful, even when you do those three phases, is because systems are engineered, systems are subject to improvement. So in future, you will not be exclusively the person dealing with that system. So what you do in object analysis and design should also be understandable by others now and in future. So that's fairly critical. So um, depending on your work environment, for example, if you go to Microsoft as a software industry, one of the leading software leaders, you will find they may have people who have, uh, uh, who engage in all those levels. At some level, they have division of labor where some people specialize for purposes of efficiency and uh, focus and accountability who focus on one stage or two of them. But eventually, uh, they may swap roles. So uh, it doesn't mean that you hide in one speciality. You say, I want to become an analyst and not a designer, or I want to become only an analyst and a designer, and then you want to learn away from using object-oriented programming languages. So you should have mastery of all so that you uh, become a better professional. And, and uh, now, uh, why that becomes important is because we are the experts uh, and the experts that we are, what we do, again, in systems development has a lot of, uh, a lot of effects in what is happening now in an institution or in individuals' life who are our users because they will depend on their, the system they get from you. So if the system has logical errors, it was poorly designed, that will interfere with the effectiveness and efficiency of their processes. So it's very important to um, emphasize on your, uh, on your uh, expertise and continue to sharpen. So in a nutshell, what you have done gives you a, a foundation to be on the lookout on what now we need to continue mastering. So we shall be uh, moving to the other uh, techniques including the notations uh, we mentioned in future sessions uh, to see what they entail, uh, allowed uh, the analysis and the design phase in the systems development process. Um, at this point, uh, until the next session, we shall be uh, engaging in those activities. So uh, commit yourself and see you uh, next session. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform.
You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.